Welcome to Cryptoland. I'm Krishna on the Volu, and today we're talking about how cryptocurrency has changed the game of cybercrime. Hackers and cyber gangs have been locking down the data of large corporations, police departments, and even hospitals, and demanding ransom. And guess what? They're asking for cryptocurrency. It's called ransomware, and it's a huge and expensive problem for all of us. For years, Bitcoin and crime were inextricably linked through drug markets on the dark web. Now, even investment bros and big companies are getting into Bitcoin, but it's still widely used for good old-fashioned crime. Here to talk about the criminal underbelly of cryptocurrency are Motherboard's Joseph Cox and Lorenzo Franceschi Bicchiari, along with Runa Sandvik, a veteran of the security industry. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, I want to talk about ransomware, how cryptocurrency is kind of the secret sauce of it all, and where it's going, what we should be afraid of, and how to you know, get in front of it. But to do that, I think we have to take a trip back in time to the dark web, to how Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies were the secret sauce of like Silk Road. So I wanna ask you, Joseph, because I know you've done a lot of reporting about that stuff. Tell me about where Bitcoin and the criminal underbelly of the world first kind of emerged together. Yeah, so I mean, this really starts with Silk Road, which was a dark website you would log on to, you would look on its digital shelves, just like Amazon or eBay, and then you could order cocaine, heroin, MDMA, whatever you want. But the two key technologies were Tor and a sort of an anonymity network, mm -hmm. which will let you browse the internet anonymously, but then also Bitcoin, which of course, you know, lets you to somewhat anonymously uh, trade money. The combination of those let people source these illegal goods, you know, essentially in the face of law enforcement. And it really showed, you know, well, maybe this cryptocurrency can be used for other criminal matters as well. If you can source the Bitcoin somewhat anonymously or securely, if you can spend it anonymously as well, ultimately, if you could then cash it out, maybe ransomware operators or hackers could use that uh, money as well. And part of that is like, Beforehand, if you want to do internet commerce, you had to use like PayPal or a credit card or all these like institutional money providers, right? So with Bitcoin, that's like, you know, not centralized, it's more anonymous. Did that like make it harder for people who are trying to catch criminals and stuff like that, Runa? Yeah, I think it's definitely been been more of a challenge. I think before Bitcoin, you had, and, and this is still the case, that you have things like gift card, you have uh, PayPal equivalents, like you have other means of, of getting uh, payments, but cryptocurrency definitely made it a whole lot easier for uh, criminals and everyone else, which then in turn made it harder for law enforcement to track and to figure out like, where are these payments going? Who's owning the wallets? How do we regulate this? How do we prevent someone from sending money to uh, criminals, for example? Um, so it's, it's definitely been been a good challenge. Yeah, and so that kind of keys into something that I think about a lot, which is cryptocurrency has democratized the concept of like, uh, you know, how value is passed between people. And it is in itself, when you think about privacy and you think about the other key cultural tenets of what crypto folks might consider sacred, the privacy, like the other side of the coin to that is like the ability to do things that are untraceable, that are, criminal perhaps. So Lorenzo, like, I, we, you know, I remember we worked together on a piece about SIM swapping. And originally it started with something that's kind of like, you know, who cares, right? It's like OG names. Mm -hmm. And with the Silk Road and the dark web, like I can get behind people buying drugs. I think like, that's fine. From a libertarian's point of view, like whatever I put in my body, my choice. But when it moves from like something that I think most of us can agree upon, which is let's buy drugs, to something that's a little bit more troubling, like let's lock up these info at a hospital. Like that's a cultural move too that has technical like key points that makes it happen. So Lorenzo, talk to me about like where the culture of thinking about the privacy of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, where the technical aspects of it lead to the proliferation of more dangerous criminality. Yeah, I mean, cryptocurrency, especially Cryptocurrency became relatively mainstream when Bitcoin was launched. You know, that was a huge innovation. Um, and, you know, this was like late 2000s. 
And initially it was just like something for computer nerds to mine, uh, hopefully make some money here and there, pay for pizza or something like that, you know, something fun to do on the internet. And then slowly it became clear that it could be used for anything, you know, paying for goods, uh, but especially paying for stuff on the internet that you're not supposed to buy or doing some sort of crimes with Bitcoin. Because especially at the beginning, people had the impression that it was essentially completely anonymous and it was a way to pay for stuff without ever have to link your name to it. I think over the years, this myth um, crumbled a little bit and now it's clear, you know, after 10, 10 years, you know, given all the people that have been arrested, you know, the Silk Road founder, the founder of Silk Road 2.0, people behind all the copycats that came out afterwards. It's clear that Bitcoin is not really anonymous, it's more pseudonymous, but it still allows you to do a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to do with PayPal or a credit card. And as Joseph said, you know, you can do it almost completely anonymously if you're careful. And so at some point, criminal gangs that were doing other stuff like, you know, computer viruses, um, stealing money from banks and then cashing it out with mules at ATMs, which is requires a lot of logistics, a lot of like real life interaction, realized that they could use this to ask for ransom. So instead of having, you know, people cashing out, I mean, you still do need to cash out at some point, but at least the payment is over Bitcoin. It's relatively anonymous and pretty quick as well. Um, it's relatively easy to use, you know, even vic victims that don't have Bitcoin can figure it out. So criminals were just like, all right, let's use it for, for ransom. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's sort of a potted history of crime, cybercrime, from the early days to now. What has been, and I guess what I'm interested to hear there is that cybercrime has always needed some kind of like physical crime part too. Like it's never just always been over the internet. Is cryptocurrency necessary for ransomware, Bruno? I don't know if it, it's necessary, but it definitely makes it a whole lot easier. Because I think um, this whole idea of ransomware is ransom in exchange for something. So whether that is gift card, physical item, cryptocurrency, something else. And so it just makes it a whole lot easier. I think it's a bit more attractive that it is sort of anonymous, it is um, harder to track. It's not impossible, but it is definitely easier to get for the criminals. It's easier to get for uh, the companies that now have to acquire uh, the cryptocurrency to, to send it. Uh, it's a bit tricky to like cash out, but it's not impossible. Mm -hmm. And you can get a whole lot of money that way. I mean, it also lets criminals operate at a much larger scale than they would have done before. You know, if you go and hack a machine, or even if you just steal an item from somebody, you say, I'll give this back if you send me $100 over PayPal or something. Okay, maybe I'll do that. How about you send me $500,000 or 1.5 million over PayPal? I mean, that's just not gonna work. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency and Bitcoin especially allows you to operate at that sort of scale. And this is the scale that ransomware gangs are operating at. They are asking for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars per victim in you know one single operation. It just puts it on a gargantuan scale that we didn't have before. Also a key feature of Bitcoin is that it's not reversible. You know, if, I, if you steal a credit card, you're a criminal, you steal a credit card, you start spending money on, I don't know, the PlayStation store or something, I can call my bank and say, hey, this wasn't me. I got the money back and... It's, it's insured. insured. Yeah, it's insured. It's just not like a really good crime at this point. Whereas with Bitcoin, I send, I send the money out and I'll never get it back unless the criminal get, gives it back to me or the FBI gets it and give it back to me. Now, the biggest ransomware that I've heard of was the Colonial Pipeline incident, which was like an oil pipeline, made the news, it was huge you know, gas shortages or gas lines in New England, stuff like that. When did it become the cybercrime du jour? I would say, I mean, cyber ransomware has been around for a long time. Uh, Joseph actually wrote a story about the, f ever, the first ever ransomware, which was over floppy disk in the 80s or something. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, but you know, at that, at that time it was really impractical. It really became a thing around 10 years ago when Bitcoin uh, started being around. And at the beginning though, like victims were smaller, you know, it was covered in like websites like ours, uh, trade magazines, trade websites, cybersecurity focused publications. 
But I would say that in the last two or three years, it has bleeded into the mainstream. You know, the Colonial Pipeline incident was definitely like the, the largest news event in terms of uh, ransomware. But even two or three years ago, you know, there were some big companies, hospitals, especially schools. You know, once you start eating people, once you start hitting institutions that interact with like people's daily lives, like schools and hospitals, then a lot of people are going to pay attention. You know, and then it's not just like a medium or small corporation in Florida or somewhere else that you don't know about, you don't get affected. If it's your school, your kid's school, your hospital, your university, then yeah, you're going to pay attention. Mm -hmm. What are you supposed to do if you get ransomware? Like, are you supposed to pay the ransom? Is there like another way of like, kind of fighting through it. Like it, the idea of taking a hostage and, and holding ransom is as old as like pirates, who knows how old it is, right? But this is just sort of a new technology to overlay upon an old criminal practice. What, what are people supposed to do if they get ransomware? I think that's like a really sort of hot debate because there's not necessarily any, any sort of like right answer to the question. Like you can choose not to pay and just know that you're not going to get that data back. Most most likely, you're not going to get it back. Um, you can pay and hopefully maybe get your data back, but then also, of course, supporting the criminals in this process. Um, what's sort of also then been interesting here is that ransomware, and I don't know exactly when, but at some point it shifted from just being someone is coming and encrypting all of your data and saying, send me Bitcoin, uh, to now send me Bitcoin and I will unlock your files and I will not publish sensitive info on the internet. Um, so now you have this component of exfiltration of really sensitive information, which is sort of like makes, um, it just gives the victims this greater incentive to actually pay the ransom. Which is to say it's like not only ransom, but blackmail. Yeah, yeah. double exactly. extortion. Right. <laughs> Which is to say, like, you not only do you lock up the data, but you also have access to all the crazy shit that people do online and they don't want that stuff out there. Exactly. And so, like, to then go back to the question of, like, what do you do? I, I think it just really depends on who you are, what you have, what's been leaked, and what kind of support you have. If you're a municipality in Norway, maybe at that point you can say, actually, we're not going to pay. We are going to accept that we've lost this data. We're going to accept that some data may now be out on the internet. Um, or you may be a private school or a private hospital or a small like mom and pop shop and you cannot take that hit. So in that case, it may be easier for you, safer for you to just pay the ransom and get back up and running. Okay, so here's the part that I wanna bring back is to Bitcoin and to cryptocurrency itself. Now I understand that Bitcoin started perhaps as more anonymous and private but isn't as much now. I want to hear about how that happened, what the deal is with that. But then the, on the other side, it's like, my understanding of, of cryptocurrencies and the blockchain is that it's a, a digital object, so to speak, that is recorded on a bunch of different computers that's non-centralized. So my sense is like, isn't Bitcoin like the ultimate marked bill? Like you know what it is because everyone knows what it is. So if you try to cash that fucker out, if you try to cash that out somewhere, bing, like there it is, we can catch the guy. So it's sort of like, I want to ask, like asking for ransom with the Mona Lisa. Like if you sell the Mona Lisa, people are going to find out. So like, talk to me about the tension between Bitcoin being, you know, supposedly, anonymous, not, not as anonymous anymore, but then like, how does that interact with the actual world of commerce and getting real cash that you can buy shit with? Yeah, I mean, of course the technology itself hasn't really changed. Uh, understanding of it certainly has and how everything is recorded, as you say, on the blockchain. And you can go on and see, well, you know, this number of Bitcoins was sent from this address to this one and that sort of thing. And it does come back to, again, the main problem, which is cashing out. And that could be for somebody who you know, even just wants to maybe sell their Bitcoins or something like that, that may not be totally always straightforward. But of course, for a criminal trying to do it somewhat anonymously or securely, this is the bottleneck basically for criminals. And it does intersect kind of what Lorenzo touched on, where you do still have physical on the ground gangs who are maybe involved in doing that cash out. You know, if you can maybe get it 
uh, into a bank account which is not in your name and you can get somebody to then go and take the physical cash out, that might be a way to do it. Or you could find another way to transfer the cash. Uh, I mean, this is such a problem that you have US law enforcement agencies even pretending to be uh, people who will cash out Bitcoin for you. So of course, criminals go to them, they have a very large uh, suitcase of cash or whatever, the transaction goes over and they can record that, well, this person's trying to get rid of a lot of uh, criminal proceeds. You know, it's such a tight bottleneck that that is where law enforcement agencies are going to gravitate towards, both in undercover operations, but also in tracking people uh, and transactions on the blockchain as well. But we didn't know that maybe five, ten years ago. It's now law enforcement have really basically got a handle on it. Even to the point of um, ransomware payments, of course, you know, a victim may not want to pay, maybe there are sanctions if uh, the entity's, you know, in Russia or, or anywhere else. But if a victim does send a Bitcoin transaction, law enforcement may actually be able to find out, you know, who that actor is, potentially. That still leaves something of a forensic clue for them to pull on. Mm -hmm. Wait, so Bitcoin isn't actually a digital object? I mean, I think you could say that. I think it's right to say that. Yeah, I think it's okay. It's, it's an analogy, right? Right, it's an yeah, analogy. Yeah, right? I think it's, it's okay. It's not a, I guess a digital object would be like a, a disc band. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but it is a collection of bits that is in and of itself an ontic yeah, being. It depends <laughs> on how you conceptualize it, yeah. Okay, um, all right, so then we're getting more sophisticated with understanding how to analyze Bitcoin. Doesn't that mean that there are going to be other cryptocurrencies that are even more private. Talk to me about like the cat and mouse that ends up happening between developers of crypto, the pressures of, uh, you know, underbelly criminal enterprises, the reality of actually cashing those out or getting that money from people who you take ransom um, and the development of things like Monero. Yeah, uh, I mean, Monero is a more privacy focused uh, cryptocurrency, you know, without going into the technical aspects of it, it does try to avoid some of the tracing issues of uh, traditional Bitcoin. And you know, there are various other ones as well. Whether they actually take off or not, you know, there's two things. Of course, there's the value. You know, Bitcoin is very valuable. And if uh, a ransomware author can extract that, maybe their, uh, their savings, for lack of a better word, will increase over time, right? That may not happen with other coins. Uh, but the, really the main issue about why I think these privacy coins haven't really taken off is because it's already hard enough for a ransomware victim to suddenly get $500,000 worth of Bitcoin. You know, maybe they could work with a company that sources that and then pays it for them. But otherwise, that's very hard to get hold of. Getting hold of $500,000 of Monero is like even harder. You know, I don't even know how you would necessarily do that. You know? <laughs> um, so it's, it, it, it's again that sort of flow and the bottleneck of cashing out, but also even sourcing the coins in the first place. Because ultimately, this is a business transaction. And if the victim of the ransomware literally doesn't have the cash to pay or the cryptocurrency to pay, well, the ransomware offers aren't going to get paid either. And, you know, the privacy coins may uh, complicate that. So you're talking about, like, I'm a hospital administrator from West Virginia or something, and I, all of a sudden, all of my computer systems are frozen up, uh, and they're like, hey, go get Monero. Right, well, what like, well, the hell is that? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, the vast majority of people are not even going to know what that is. And in some of the ransomware notes, the hackers do kindly say, oh, don't worry if you don't know about Bitcoin. Uh, here's a link. You can follow these instructions. <laughs> you can go to this website and you can buy them. So, oh, th yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's very kind. That's helping me out, yeah. yeah. And, and maybe they that's also exist for Monero. I haven't, I haven't seen that. But the process of getting Monero, would, I imagine, would be hard. You know, if you go buy Bitcoin, you sometimes need to create an account on the exchange. They need to verify your identity, maybe with an SSN or driver's license or something. You have to link that to a bank account because a lot of these platforms have know your customer policies now and compliance because of the greater regulatory focus, obviously, on the industry. And you're trying to do all of that bureaucracy while your hospital is like on complete lockdown and people may get hurt because right. you know all these computers have been encrypted. Um, that's not only stressful, but just logistically incredibly difficult. Right, uh, which is, proposes this interesting like kind of bedfellow situation where it's like Bitcoin is now, we're at this point where it's both like the plaything of your like cool uncle who like knows a thing or two is like, yeah, look, check it out, Bitcoin. Like I'm, all my savings are in Bitcoin now. And it's also the provenance of like deep and problematic criminal enterprises. So it's like, if you think about the cultural moment of what Bitcoin is today versus what it started as at, as what it was, like, isn't it 
fucking weird that like we're talking about cryptocurrency. We can talk about something as far as retirement savings and as crazy as shutting down a hospital system or a pipeline. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've been following Bitcoin for a while. I've, and to me, it's crazy that it is now like a real industry. You know, we have companies in New York. They're like finance companies, essentially. These companies sponsor Formula One teams or soccer teams in Europe. Like, that's insane to me. You know, it was always... I. I sort of always th thought that it was going to be a niche thing for geeks, and now it's completely mainstream. And as you say, it's jarring that, like, on one hand, you have these like finance companies in New York that sponsor sports team, and then you have this underbelly of like Russian or Eastern European criminals that use it for for bad stuff. Talk to me about the topography of the criminal network and enterprise. Like, it does feel like it's invisible, but surely there must be some work about like who's behind most of this. Like, where does it bottleneck, as you were saying, Joseph? Mm -hmm. uh, Runa, you're this security <laughs> expert. What, what is like, put the pieces on the cork board and together for me. I was looking to Lorenzo. Oh, okay, for this Lorenzo, one. please. Sorry, um, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, this is why ransomware is huge now and could not have been huge even 15 or 20 years ago. You know, right now, hospitals rely on computers to do pretty much everything. You know, you shut down the hospital's computer network or computers, and all of a sudden, doctors cannot access patients' um, charts or information. They don't know what the patient is in the hospital even for. Uh, surgeries don't work as easily. They, it's, everything is get, gets harder. Uh, you know, companies, it's even worse. You know, everything is in um, all the emails, documents, Everything gets encrypted. All of a sudden, you can't do your job. If a TV station gets hacked, like uh, last week, Sinclair Broadcast Group got hacked, all of a sudden, you don't have teleprompters. You mm -hmm. don't have uh, weather uh, graphics. And this was a ransomware attack. Yeah, exactly. It was a ransomware attack. So this is why ransomware is big, because if you can lock computers at pretty much any company or even or schools, municipalities, police, all of a sudden, they cannot do their daily jobs. So it's a, that's a fairly obvious point to some degree, which is to say, like, we're so dependent upon computing systems, the software behind it, and its connectivity, that even the simplest managerial task takes these pieces of digital infrastructure. And if you lock those up, then you've got a lot of leverage on people to extract money from them, which, you know, as you were saying, 10 years ago wasn't really the case, right? Like, charts in hospitals were still floating around. Uh, you could order things with pieces of paper, like things like that. So this is like, ransomware is this like weird flip side or underbelly of our increased reliance on digital technologies to make things go faster and better. And I imagine it's even more so because of the pandemic, right? Like where everyone's connected from large distances and stuff. I mean, although ransomware, the crime itself is digital, you know, they will send a piece of malware over the internet and you know, maybe there'll be an exploit or maybe it'll be over an email. And of course it's digitally, you know, infecting the computers. The second degree effects of that are kinetic. They're, they're physical. They are, you know, shutting down infrastructure. They're shutting down communications. And this is beyond, obviously, if a piece of malware steals your banking login details or your credit card information. Yeah, sure, that's still kind of wishy-washy digital. The bank will refund you, that sort of thing. Yeah. They're not. The, 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 they're not coming and you know kicking you out of your house or something. But that's essentially what ransomware is. It is digitally and in some cases physically locking you up. My question then revolves around the actual piece of uh, ransomware. Like how can a piece of software be so powerful as to totally disable another software system and be totally like unsolvable by me? Like if I get locked out of my computer, why can't I go to like the crypto A team to be like, can you just like get this stupid piece of malware off my system so I can order seamless? Sure. So. The ransomware would then somehow um, end up on your computer. Like you clicked on a link, you downloaded an attachment, it used um, a flaw in the system to somehow get itself onto your system. So at this point, um, it can exist on your system, it can encrypt all of your files, and you can sort of take that computer um, out of the equation. But then depending on how the computer network is set up, that ransomware can then spread to other computers around you and hmm. on the same network. Um, and that just also is sort of a bit of a challenge just around like how is the network set up? How many computers on that network can your computer communicate with? Um, which 
is a sort of much, much bigger challenge or from like an organizational point of view. Um, and then you can also, since we talked about uh, schools and pipelines and um, I would say sectors that years ago did perhaps didn't use technology as much as they do now. And then instead of like thinking about back then, if we're gonna go online, if we're gonna use tech and if we're gonna be all internet connected, how do we do this in a safe way? They sort of figure out how to get online. And then the question of, well, how do we do this safely is sort of something that is coming up now. Right, so resiliencies in systems. So like, yeah. is there like a, a, a plan B? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I mean, it is kind of funny. It's like, we're all really pumped and excited about everything being connected by computers. And it's like, the software is so good and the interfaces look really great. But our reliance on the actual systems itself becomes a weakness that can be exploited. So I guess the question then that I have then is, in the world of ransomware and the larger history of cyber crime, are we just at that inflection point where it, it's like, okay, cool, now like people have gotten wind of it, we're gonna have workarounds. Basically, are we past the big wave to a point where we can take a bit of a deep breath because we got it figured out? Or are we still in this, in like the, the beginnings where this might get more common because of X, Y, or Z? That's my big question, I think. Yeah, it's only gonna get worse, I'm pretty sure. You know, like we've seen po historically in ransomware, we've seen little pockets of victims, you know, maybe we a small hospital or something like that and they get locked down and that's okay. And, you know, either they pay or they get an expert in or something like that. It is continually escalating, not only from the types of targets, like the colonial pipeline, but the ransomware gangs themselves, they're now going for companies that actually sell software to hundreds of thousands of other companies. So if they hack this one very juicy target, huh. they push the ransomware to hundreds of victims. Wow. And then they can extort all of them one by one. The scale is just exponentially increasing. And of course, we are having some sort of government response uh, to ransomware gangs, be that, you know, maybe sanctions or discussions uh, with other nation states or perhaps, you know, offensive hackers from the US or other governments going, a, going to try and actually get ransomware gangs. <laughs> uh, in response, you know, some of the gangs have gone dark. You know, they don't want to deal with the US government, maybe trying to hack into their systems. But others are quite, you know, they're stepping in and they're like, well, we'll take it. If someone else, somebody else will come in and try to take that profit because it's just such a billion dollar industry. Um, at this point, you know, I don't see it slowing down anytime soon unless there's serious ramping up from governments themselves as well. Is there any estimate as to like how much ransomware has cost like the US economy or the world economy or individual governments or individual corporations? I don't think it was uh, specifically sort of the government cost, but there were figures put out by the Treasury Department that says that individual ransomware gangs are making billions of dollars each. You know, wow. And there are dozens of ransomware gangs. Not to say all of those are going to be making billions. Maybe sure. some will just make, you know, a few million or something, which is, you know, change for these guys, or maybe tens or hundreds of millions. But this is a crazy lucrative business to the point where you have um, cybercrime gangs who were focused more on professionalized banking trojans, getting that, cashing out OTMs. They look at the more thuggish uh, ransomware operators and they go, maybe we should just do this as well. And you have seen that clear pivot from more traditional cybercrime gangs to, well, let's just get into ransomware as well. So who are these people, right? We talk about cybercrime gangs and they sound very nefarious and stuff, but there must be some understanding of who the actual people are, where they're based, uh, how they operate. What's that reporting like? So at this point, we have a pretty good idea of what these groups are. You know, they're pretty big. You know, you can think of them as organized crime. You know, instead of a you know, shooting up uh, or instead of burning down shops and then asking for for money, they lock your computers and then ask for a Bitcoin. Um, and it's, most of them are large organizations. You know, there's the people, the developers who write the malware and make sure that, you know, it's gonna work, it's gonna lock down the computer, it's gonna be impossible to uh, unlock unless uh, the ransomware operators give them the keys. Then there's the people that actually send the malware out. You know, those maybe not the same people that write the malware. Then there's the people that interact with the victims, because you know once the victim gets ransomware, they get a note and say, and you know the note, as Joseph said, 
may have some pretty detailed instructions on how to pay because you know these guys also want to get paid as soon as possible, yeah. as quick as possible. So there's so some customer service involved. There's customer service, yeah. <laughs> there's like a chat where victims can say, hey, you know, uh, we got our computers locked, please give us our files back. So those people are like completely different and they may not even know who they're working for. You know, there must, there, most of the time there's like layers of anonymity between the uh, different uh, parts of the organization. Then there's the people that cash out the Bitcoin. Um, there's also more sophisticated, uh, th there's also a new kind or newish kind of ransomware, which is called ransomware as a service. So there's like gangs that all they do is write the malware, the mm -hmm. ransomware, they don't even do, they don't even hack people. They're just like, and they sell it as a subscription model. So like they advertise this malware out and say, hey, if you use it and you hit victims with Wait, this. Wait, where do they advertise it? Like dark web or <laughs> websites like that, chat chat groups, um, underground chat groups. And in but, but what I'm hearing from you is that there's like an ecosystem of commerce around this very mm -hmm. phenomenon and it's only getting bigger. Yeah, as Joseph said, like this is such a good business. You know, it's relatively easy to get into, especially if like, because of this subscription model, this ransomware as a service, you don't even need to know how to write malware. Mm. You can just take somebody else's malware, infect victims, and then pay the, the creators like 10%, 5%, whatever it is. And you don't even have to deal with the technical aspects of it that are, that, those are the most challenging, right? Creating malware, malware that, that works, that's gonna be reliable, that's the big challenge. The rest is logistics. So it's not necessarily just held within an organized crime network, like say, you know, who's growing the drugs, so to speak. It is like, you can freelance on this marketplace and then people buy your product. Yeah, I mean, beyond the subscription model, we also have these people who are called affiliates, which are the ones who will actually go in and break into the target, which is a completely different skill set. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you find an employee to plug in a USB key into a server on your behalf if you promise them a certain amount of money. Maybe you find that uh, a particular company is running some vulnerable software on their server or something like that. Maybe you've just managed to get an exploit and you don't even know who you're gonna target. You're like, well, I have this very good server exploit. Let's see who's vulnerable. I don't really care who's vulnerable. I'm just gonna fire this ransomware and do that sort of thing. But yeah, they're not necessarily the ones making the malware. In fact, in fact, probably often they're not the ones making the malware. There's affiliate program where you know they'll split it 70-30 or something like that. It does sound like organized crime with money trickling to the top, but everybody kind of getting their slice along the way as well, because everybody needs sort of everybody else to survive in a way. I mean, if I'm like the Sinaloa cartel, I might be like, hey, let's get in the game on this, right? Like, is it going to the point of transnational crime where it's up there with the other big transnational crimes that we talk about all the time. I mean, you had that piece on Italy. Yeah, they're starting to be, I mean, this was a prediction that cybersecurity experts have made for a long time that, you know, traditional organized crime, like the mob, the Camorra, the mafia, whatever, would get into cybercrime. And we're, we haven't seen it that much yet, um, but we're starting to see it. Like earlier this year, we reported that the Italian mafia, uh, was using hackers to launder money and just make some money on the side. In that case, it was like SIM swapping, for example, credit card uh, fraud. Um, so, you know, I, as Joseph said, like this is gonna be a problem for a long time. And I think we're just starting to see that it's gonna be really big. You know, for a few years, this was just a few companies here and there. Now it's, you know, pipeline companies, huge hospitals, TV stations. Uh, it's just too good of a business for organized crime not to get into because it's also safer. You know, you don't need to point your gun at anyone. You don't need to kill anyone. Um, you just sure. do stuff on your computer. I think it's um, in interesting then to sort of look at um, what is it that allows for ransomware to be so big and to continue getting bigger. Like at some point in time in history, we all learned that we should have curtains on our windows, right? And we learned that we should probably have locks on our doors, that if um, your um, business is getting an office, you should probably have fire insurance. And so looking at like those lessons and putting that into the context of this challenge with, with ransomware, I think ransomware is far more than just a cybersecurity problem. Because um, really, if you, if you look at um, what allows ransomware to spread within a company, it comes down to the way that the network is structured and the way that it looks and the operating system that the computers are running. Now, why isn't that necessarily up to date? Why is it structured the way that it is? Why hasn't it been 
uh, changed to be more secure, which then comes back to, do you have dedicated IT staff? Is this one single person doing absolutely everything and trying to scale your company to 5,000 employees and making sure they can all work from home during the pandemic? Are you investing in people to do that type of work? Are you actually putting in the resources to ensure that your security team, your IT team, can actually secure your company the way that it should be done in 2021? Mm -hmm. And then coming back to crypto for a second, because I think what I'm hearing from you guys is crypto is inherently part of this ransomware challenge because it is inherently in some ways and kind of an anonymous way of paying people and fairly easy now. Mm -hmm. Maybe it wasn't 10 or 15 years ago, right? Like there are exchanges, I can, you can go and I can set up a wallet or whatever and, and buy it, I could do it. I couldn't do that 10, 15 years ago. So when we're thinking about ransomware and we're looking at it as a manifestation of a, this larger push towards more cryptocurrencies in the world, seeing the good, of course, seeing the bad, seeing the challenges, um, ransomware as it's proliferating now, is it an unintended consequence of some of the, you know, more altruistic or humanistic or libertarian or whatever aspects of cryptocurrency come to life and like really come and biting us in the butt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the freedom that cryptocurrency can offer, of course, it also offers it to, to criminals as well. You know, as, as we see greater regulation sort of in the cryptocurrency space, whether that's exchanges doing more know your customer sort of things, or whether there's, you know, an increasingly proactive monitoring of the blockchain, or, you know, maybe asking more people to declare where that currency is coming from. I mean, that could have an impact on uh, the criminal elements, because ultimately that is the point that they're going to have to target, you know, beyond arresting people, literally, these people care about money, right? And you, you fuck with their money, that's really going to mess up their their operations and so focusing very specifically on the cryptocurrency is what some experts think like that's going to be where you may want to focus your efforts to actually disrupt some of these groups but then there's a the cat and mouse right like if you can do that with bitcoin someone's out someone out there is going to be like oh i want to develop a new crypto that is more secure like more uh because i believe that privacy and anonymity are two founding elements of internet culture these high-minded ideals, I'm gonna make the perfect coin for crime. <laughs> right. You know? But if someone... Because I'm sure that the founders of Monero were like, let's make the perfect crypto for crime, right guys? Right, right. And I mean, this is a little bit hypothetical, but the DOJ has been doing this thing where they will target and prosecute people who do make technology specifically for crime. Hmm. So... Okay, right. But that's a, a high bar to... You have to, like, show right, intention, right? An organized, right? Uh, so they've, they've arrested people who make the encrypted phones for organized crimes. So yep. You send messages and that sort of thing, and they have people admitting that, I made this for drug trafficking or something like that. If someone came out and said, I made the coin for crime, that, I mean, they may be successful. They may get away with it but I'm sure the DOJ would at least try to target them. That's not to say it won't happen. You know, in fact, it might even be likely, you know, that would be a fantastic business opportunity for somebody like this if they could generate a bunch of interest and get the coins themselves as well. But they would, they would be put on the US government's radar mm -hmm. pretty quickly. But it's sort of like, I guess I don't really buy it, I guess, and maybe I'm kind of a cynic here when those in the crypto community would say, we're doing this for the, these high-minded ideals of, of privacy, qua privacy. However, the real world like use case is so clearly not necessarily something we wanna get behind like ransomware. So it's like, I could be like, yeah, I'm inventing the crowbar, you know? And it's because I love simple machines and I think this is a beautiful, like perfect application of that. But, oh, oh my God, someone's using it to break into a house? Like, not my fault. Like that's, that is this like weird, tension that like keeps me interested in what crypto is because yeah people want to innovate people want to I, express themselves as far as like what they want to make with technology but then there's always it seems like this inevitable leap when you go from privacy to crime and like i don't know what to do about it i'm not here to like preach about it but what do you make of that i mean to be honest at, at this point 2021 what, what is Bitcoin useful for other than speculation? Like you buy it, you hold it, and then you sell it again. I cannot use it to go to a restaurant and pay for it. I Unless cannot, you're in El Salvador. <laughs> yeah, I cannot use it to like go on Amazon and pay for stuff. Uh, you know, Tesla for a while was accepting Bitcoin and then they're like, no, we don't want to do it anymore because it just too, fluctuates too wildly. 
So Bitcoin is basically money for criminals. So as Joseph said, at some point, and it's happening already, the governments are going to be like, okay, can we crack down on this? You know, can we just prevent people from using Bitcoin? And as you said, yeah, other coins will come up, but maybe they will not be as easy to, to use. Maybe they will not be as popular. Maybe there will not be that many around. They will be not as valuable as Bitcoin. So it is definitely the way to go after these guys because you're not going to stop malware from ever existing. You know, as long as we have computers, there will be malware. Mm -hmm. And it's just a different problem. Whereas if you can crack down on cryptocurrency, then maybe you can at, at, at least slow down the problem. Well, but I think my, you know, my uncle, who's really into Bitcoin these days, would say, no, it's not made for crime. It's made for uh, a new dawn of thinking about currencies, not as a fiat you know, thing that governments that are sovereign do, but a way for us as peer to peer is to, to, to really think about what value is. And, and we, we can be the ones who like determine our future, not governments. Like, but how many people actually use Bitcoin without going through an exchange, which is essentially like a bank or like a stock market or whatever you want, like a financial institution? You know, mm -hmm. I bet that most people who have Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, they are on Coinbase, they're on Gemini, they're on these companies that are essentially, they, cent they centralize Bitcoin, they centralize cryptocurrency. So we're back, it's the same financial system. It's starting to be just as regulated as the old financial system. And it's just not, it's not libertarian, it's not a libertarian dream anymore. If Satoshi Nakamoto was still around, or if, if he's still around, he probably would not be happy about this. Or sure. he's not happy about this. If well, he's I, alive, who knows? If, and even if that <laughs> if, was- If you if are, it, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it, like, it also reminds me of like, oh, I'm going to set up a anonymized chat online, a message board, and it's all about freedom of speech. You know, like that's it. Like, we're not going to censor anything. And then all of a sudden, you know, it becomes a, a, a den of like horrifying misogyny and, and you, know, um, you know what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah, congrats, right? you made 4chan. Yeah, precisely. So it's like, the, the, I get a little queasy when people point to idealism as a way, as a, a motive for making a new, like, kind of radical technology product. Because inevitably it seems like it's used in ways that are, you know, bad for people. Like, harm happens. I mean, I, I would push back a little bit on that. I think that people do make especially cryptography-based products because they do believe, look, we want to have a really secure messaging system. We mm -hmm. believe that everybody should have the right to having, you know, secure messages or video or anything like that. And they go out and they do these things. And I think a lot of those people do genuinely believe that. Uh, where they may falter is that they may be naive, perhaps, or um, some sort of other slight nuance to it, to the, to the effects that come after that. You know, I don't think it's mutually exclusive that you can have somebody who genuinely believes that privacy is a net good, for example, and, you know, everybody should have the right to that. And yes, it can also perhaps facilitate something else uh, on the side. I don't think they're necessarily mutually exclusive. How they respond to that and how they, you know, um, with intellectual honesty sort of uh, grapple with that, I think that's where like the real crux of their argument is. And, you know, some will do very poorly at that, where they will just say, no, 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 it's all good, it's all fine. And some will engage with it. And perhaps there is some sort of mechanism or slightly more messy middle ground that can be found. But at the end of the day, cryptography is, you know, a technological solution. And if you have somebody arguing that, well, we have very strong message encryption, now let's start undermining it, that then brings up all other sorts of issues uh, as well. So I think people can believe it, but the effects, yeah, can get very, um, very distant from that original vision. And they may not want to deal with it. Yeah, and, and this is the rubber hitting the road on like a new technology hitting society, hitting the, you know, the legacy of society of like, hey, crime happens and like, you know, people looking to exploit will find levers to exploit. Uh, and also, you know, regular old folks want to get into to Bitcoin because it seems like a nice place to put some money and it's going to go up over time. Mm -hmm. And like, I guess maybe t tell me if I'm wrong, but like I think about cryptocurrencies as little subcultures, you know, like you're into Bitcoin maybe because it's going up and it's, you know, you got in early, you're into Ethereum because like you like whatever his name's idea of like why the thing exists uh, and and whatever, the, you know, substitute Dogecoin in or the other ones as well, or Weedcoin, that's my favorite. Um, these subcultures exist 
but can also be levered to other weird things that aren't necessarily part of the original intention. And I think we're finding that in so many different ways in our lives these days, uh, especially when the internet is involved, especially when new technologies are involved. And so it's like, I think it's just nuts that we're talking about shutting down the oil that goes from the Gulf to the Northeast because of cryptocurrencies. I think it's nuts that we're talking about trans criminal organizations and multi-level marketing schemes, but like a whole ecosystem of commerce around this kind of ransomware. And I think it's kind of nuts that like, you know, one day your like grandmother is in the hospital somewhere and might die or not get the medical care she needs because some yokel in Eastern Europe is like a, a broker for a broker at a broker. You know, it's like the way that we're connected these days is so nuts. And this is, we're talking about cryptocurrency here. It's, it's wild. Yeah, I, I don't think Satoshi Nakamoto would have necessarily anticipated just the tangible impacts this was going to have. You know, when creating this uh, ledger system for recording digital transactions, that's a, you know, building on previous work, but novel in its implementation. I don't think you would go from that to then say, well, this is going to result in people being put in harm's way in the hospital because the computer got right. knocked down, you know, and I obviously don't really blame them because I, I don't know how you'd even imagine that sort of conception. Obviously, it took a long time as well. But the idea that as a community, you can make something, people will adopt that outside of your community for whatever the hell they want. They don't care what you think. The technology is neutral for better and for good. And they can pull the lever, as you say, for whatever they may like as well, for good and for bad. But my mind goes back to like Oppenheimer when they split the atom and they saw it. And he's like, I, I have become Shiva, the like, the uh, not creator, the destroyer of life, right? Because mm -hmm. you can see the fucking explosion, mm -hmm. right? But when these sorts of technologies, as far as the way bits are arranged and shared on servers and the cultures that come up, like you can't see it in the inherent technology itself. It's not visual, visual until you see the manifestations in the real world. And so ransomware and crypt, like as it relates to cryptocurrency is a really bizarre and potentially you know, dangerous way that splitting the atom of, hey, let's make a new kind of currency is exploding on the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot more obvious when you're, you're splitting the atom, right? Because the application is, is right there and then. And then years down the line, you, you don't know what Bitcoin is going to be used for. We don't know what it's going to be used for in the future as well. We're constantly hearing of new ways and the, the, the ecosystem is scamming people, leveraging people, or this move towards dumping information publicly to try to um, force victims to pay up as well, you know, more literal blackmail. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was another evolution beyond the leaking of this, I don't know what that would be, but they're gonna keep trying to monetize this somehow, you know? Can I buy ransomware insurance? You can buy cyber insurance. Okay. So yeah, there are companies that um, for one reason or another, in some cases, because of compliance and they have to get that insurance, some companies that choose to get that insurance, um, there's been ransomware uh, actors that have specifically gone after companies that they know have insurance because the insurance will pay out. Um, that is, you know, another uh, thing that your security budget will go to is now to pay insurance. And if you do have a ransomware type of attack, premium is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Now, here's another question. People mine Bitcoin, right? And they do it in semi-industrial ways, you know, because you can. Uh, are there any Bitcoin miners out there who are like selling directly to ransomware victims? Mm, I haven't heard of that, so. It'd be hard well, to say. Take note, yeah. Bitcoin miners, that <laughs> yeah. might be a good, yeah, exactly. just cut out the middleman, you know yeah, what I mean? Totally. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't heard that personally. No. So I guess like the big, the big issues here are about how a new technology is being used in new ways for an old idea, crime. Crime is as old as the internet itself. It's crazy that it's cryptocurrency. Uh, it might get worse and bigger. Like. When we imagine what cryptocurrencies are going to be in 10 years and 20 years, we know they're not going to be exactly like this, right? But with the information that we have so far, does it suggest that cryptocurrencies are something that are going to help humanity work towards the goals that I think some of these founders hoped for and to begin with? Is it, can we rein it back in? Like, I, I want to know these big questions because A, I want to know if I should buy Bitcoin right now, you know what I'm saying? And B, um, did we let, like, did we open up a Pandora's box here? 
I don't think Bitcoin is going to make a good difference in the world. Um, it's already unsustainable in terms of uh, climate and ecological impact. Uh, as you said, to mine it now, you need like warehouses full of computers or PlayStations or GeForce uh, graphics cards that are super expensive, that they use a lot of electricity, and it's, it's only going to get worse. It's designed to get harder and harder and harder to mine Bitcoin. So it's only going to get like it's an arms race. Uh, some countries like China have, have banned uh, mining Bitcoin. Uh, that's going to happen in other countries as well. And you know, as I said earlier, you can't really use it for anything useful. You can't pay your pizza with Bitcoin anymore. Uh, also because it takes forever for the payment to go through. So you pay with Bitcoin and someone has to wait like a couple of days to see that the payment actually went through. It's just not practical as a means of payment. It's only like gold, you know, like you can use it for specu to speculate, hoping that it will go up. Or you can use it to pay criminals. Or for clout, like gold, like, you know, if you're Bitcoin rich on paper, that's kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah, you can buy Lamborghinis. That's good for you. I, would, you know. I mean, I, I do think that like we, we could have had a discussion about uh, the ways in which that uh, cryptocurrency is used for good. So like back in the day, we had this whole debate about uh, Tor allows bad people to do bad things on the dark web. We then also focused on what are good ways that you can use Tor. And now that discussion is a bit more balanced than it was back then. I think now, yes, ransomware is definitely a big problem. It is something that we need to figure out how to how to solve or how to mitigate. Um, and I do think that that uh, going after how they're making money is, is sort of one, one part of that puzzle. Uh, but like we could have had a whole debate about how cryptocurrency is actually supporting uh, content creators and sex workers and people who do business, which uh, we might consider legitimate business, but that the visas and MasterCards and PayPal's of the world would disagree with. Yeah. And that's that's the like hope, right? And it, it's happening yeah. and we can talk, we will talk about that, I'm sure at some point. But um, it's like, the unintended consequences, or maybe like an insurer would call it like the externalities, like it's an, ex an externality of the good of what crypto can do is the bad of what crypto can do, which is like shut down a fucking hospital. Yeah. Which is like, okay, we have to balance that and figure out whether that balance is something that's sustainable, that balance can tip on so little, and we just don't know what it tips on, right? And that's like what, when we're at this, we're like at the fucking precipice of a new era, maybe, or at the precipice of a time when you just don't know what is going to be important. And I think that's like the work you guys do is so is so interesting because the littlest thing can make the biggest difference, right? Like yeah. as far as how the, the currency itself is uh, is mined for, or, you know, the proof of work stuff, like how the security of our computer systems is how resilient it is. Like the littlest things that you or me or anyone is not paying attention to can have the biggest impact on what happens tomorrow. I guess it's always been the case, but it seems like you can really see it when it comes to crypto. You can really see it when it comes to ransomware. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the very small individual tasks that maybe an, an IT worker in an organization is doing, and it could be something that sounds as simple as keeping all of their computers up to date or something like that. I mean, in practice, when you're working with hundreds of thousands of employees, that actually can be very, very difficult, um, a little bit more complex, but on the face of it, it's very simple. Let's say, the IT worker did do that and kept all the computers up to date. That's a ransomware gang potentially kicked out. You know, that's potentially a million dollar, two million dollar, whatever incident completely averted because of this seemingly kind of overlooked uh, issue or very small decision that someone's made. And there are tons of those different ones. You know, so in a different organization, maybe they have to update this piece of software or over here it could be something else. Or maybe, you know, a certain exchange gets shut down or something like that. There are so many variables uh, in this space that there is room for improvement in certain bits, uh, but it's just so large that, you know, these tiny little wins here and there, they're not going to tip the balance at all, like in the overarching war, basically, uh, against ransomware. Wow. That's, I mean, I was hoping for a different answer there. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but if everybody does all those little decisions, then maybe we can do it, but that, that's, that's a Herculean task, you know, that would be absolutely insane. But, you know, if, if an individual hospital IT worker or IT team can stop a ransomware attack, I mean, that's a win there, at least for that team. You know? Right. Yeah. There are organizations that can make different choices. You know, I think a hospital, for example, is bound by privacy laws like HIPAA. 
they may not be allowed to like store stuff in the cloud, like on Google Drive or Dropbox or st something or things like that. But if you're a school, and there have been examples of schools that are completely online from, like they, they work on Google Clouds, you know, they work on Drive, they use Google Docs, they use Google Spreadsheets. They don't have actual physical servers, their emails are Gmail. And those, those schools have been hit by ransomware and nothing has happened because the ransomware only hit like a couple of personal computers of people that wanted to use Microsoft Word because they're, they're not very good at Google Docs. But those organizations never even had to think about paying or not paying. Their, you know, their because, operations just kept going. Why? Because the ransomware cannot uh, lock, lock down stuff that's on the cloud. They're not, that would mean like hacking Google. That would mean ransomwareing that would mean installing ransomware on Google servers. Ah, if you don't have any servers, you don't have any computers, you know, you can you can buy Chromebooks right now. Those are actually, they're not, you know, they're computers, but they're basically like a browser. You mm -hmm. can just, there's no files on them. You just rely on Google's cloud. And that way you solve the ransomware problem. Except all your shit's on Google's cloud now, and now you're yeah, completely maybe, dependent upon Google. Yeah, maybe you don't want, you know, you don't like that privacy trade-off. Or if you're a larger company, you have some sort of a fiduciary duty that you, you cannot put stuff on the cloud. Yep. So it's not, you know, it's not a solution that can scale, but if you're a school or, a, I don't know, a, a small company, then you can do that. Um, okay, let's, do, let's go into service, like news you can use. Like what's the digital hygiene situation here for preventing your small business, hospital, otherwise from getting ransomware? Or me, like me, how can I not get ransomware? Because I'm scared. Uh, I mean, personal, it would just be the same sort of stuff, unfortunately, that you've heard year after year, which is horrible to just have drilled into your head, but it is really, you know, keep your software, your operating system up to date, try not to download uh, sketchy uh, executables, try to only download verified apps, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. Um, but that's that's basically it, you know, and try, try not to click links as well. I mean, I would say that it's kind of more important now that ransomware, yes, initially it did target personal computers. You know, oh, my family member had their computer locked down or something like that. Sure, that may and does still happen, but we're at a different scale now. The ransomware actors aren't trying to target your family. They're trying to target the company that provides software to hundreds of other companies. It's just qualitatively something else now. So I, Cautiously, I would almost say that it's kind of reassuring that you know maybe your family doesn't have to you know be on edge about it all the time because they don't care as much about you anymore when they're a much much bigger fish. Well, that, that's from. where Runa comes in, right? So tell what are the bigger fish? Are, what are they doing? What do they have to do? Like I want to know everything. Right. So, so in in some cases, like it could be you're working from home, you decide that you don't want to use your wife's laptop because it is heavy, it is slow, it is boring, it doesn't have the background that you like, whatever. So you use your personal one, but then that gets ransomware. You then connect it to the vice network. If that network is completely what we would call a flat network, so like everything can talk to everything else mm -hmm. versus your computer can just talk to like one other computer on the network, that's also a way to just like limit the exposure, for mm -hmm. example. Um, if you're using a third-party company, for example, to manage all of the computers on your network, then the question becomes, how can you then integrate that safely? How do you leverage third-party software safely within your company? And I think that um, for many companies, I would, I would love to see more people talk internally about, well, if we got ransomware today, what would that look like for us with the current architecture, with the way that we handle updates and the way that people can install software and the way that the network looks? And what's it going to take for us to actually, if not prevent, then at least make that um, exposure uh, smaller in scale? So maybe it affects five computers instead of 5,000. Um, and I think that those discussions typically just don't happen. It's mm. in many cases just sort of seen as a cybersecurity problem. Um, and cybersecurity is like a cost center. It's not something that actually generates money for you. So it's not something that, that gets um, the budget that it needs. So give, give me the pitch then. Like if, if I'm, I own a company that's, you know, mid-sized yeah. and I got tiny margins, but we got to keep going and I have a fiduciary responsibility to many investors to make sure that we turn a certain amount of profit. What is the pitch to me 
to be like, yo, dude, you got to pay attention to ransomware. So in that case, I would say uh, consider the type of uh, computers that you're using. So Lorenzo mentioned Chromebooks, for example. If you have the choice between do we want to use computers where we're responsible for updates and patching and apps and network and storage and backups and all of these things, do we have the money, do we have the resources to actually keep that going? Mm -hmm. Or is it easier for us to just invest in something like Chromebooks and just rely on Google's cloud service? At that point, ransomware is sort of off the table. Uh, software updates become a whole lot easier. Lorenzo's point, everything is in the browser, so you don't really have to deal with like software updates for like other things. Mm -hmm. um, and the laptops are cheap and light and pretty. But what about if like I own a button factory, right? And yeah. my buttons are made in Indonesia and like they run on a certain software. Like how, I guess like, tell me about what you're doing. Like when you when you talk to a company that's trying to trying to figure out, hey, we don't want to get ransomware. Yeah, I think in in that case, it sort of depends on like the type and the uh, size of the company. But then it just sort of comes down to this like balance of what are the uh, sort of older systems that you have to keep, and we just have to find a way to secure them. We can put them perhaps on a network on its own. We don't have to connect that to everything else and the light bulbs and the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. So just try to figure out like where can we make some changes in the architecture? Where can we make some changes in the type of technology that we're using? But to your point, that does require a conversation. It does require some investment. You do actually have to like sit down and think about how does our network and architecture look today and what are ways in which that we could change it? And you'd have to allow for uh, financial and time investment in actually making those improvements when you then um, have, you know, onboarding, offboarding, new hires, day-to-day -day business. Um, it, it does become this like forever problem that security people are like trying to address and trying to work on, but they don't necessarily get uh, all the intention that, that they would need. Do you think that companies are taking ransomware for the threat that it is? Do you think they're actually responding as one would, like when you think about how easy it could be for any given company to be ransomware? No, I don't. I think that in, in many ways, ransomware is still seen as a cybersecurity problem that the cybersecurity people uh, can and should fix. Uh, and it's not seen as something that would impact um, corporate communications, it might impact HR, it might impact the legal department, finance, the individual who deals with insurance. Just think about um, if you get hit with ransomware and PII is taken, depending on the state or the country, you may then be required to notify a governing body about the fact that this data has not been taken. Um, that is a much larger problem that goes way beyond just what the security team is working on. But I don't think that a lot of companies have really thought about it in that way and just thought about the number of resources that they would have to put in to um, respond to that type of incidents. I mean, in the pitch uh, to the CEO or whoever found the security team, you'd be saying that, look, don't think about necessarily the cost of keeping the updates going or whatever. It may be, what cost are you going to face? both, you know, if our computers get locked down and we can't actually do work, but what costs are you going to face if our trade secrets are published on the dark web, which is happening every single week, hmm. you know, day, potentially, depending on the ups and downs of the ransomware uh, ecosystem? Like, can you face that cost of our competitors being able to see our internal information, uh, you know, customers as well, potentially if there's something shady or you just don't want that sort of information out there? Can you front that cost up and maybe you should think about it more in those sorts of terms rather than the literal cost of buying computers or something like that but of course we're human we're awful at that sort of thinking you know whether it comes to climate or whether it's thinking about the ransom the what will happen when ransomware eventually comes um, but that's how you have to think about it you know the actual trade-off that you have to face when you are infected not really if you are infected because if you're vulnerable the ransomware gang will just come for you you know, like they, they don't care who you are. They care that you're a business, they care you're vulnerable, and they care that you have the ability to get money or buy cryptocurrency. They don't, they don't care who the CEO is, you know. It sounds like they're a business themselves that so, are similarly chasing profits. Right, it's a business transaction and a business ecosystem, and they will 
maximize their profits just like anybody else. Now, coming to a, a conclusion here, I want to kind of sew this back to cryptocurrencies again, because I mean, my basic question, like if it weren't for cryptocurrencies, would there be the kind of ransomware epidemic uh, that we're seeing today? No, it would just be much harder. Like, how do you deal with payments? You know, do you set up a PayPal account? How do you do that? You need a bank account. Um, well, it used to be just like deliver a briefcase or a duffel bag of cash, right? Yeah, or use something like Western Union. You know, there are still some relatively pseudonymous ways of sending money around the world, but you know, they take a big chunk of the transaction. There are other risks, like you have to go to a Western Union uh, office or storefront to get the money out. There may be cameras, there, there is a paper trail. With Bitcoin, there are just those risks are not eliminated completely, but they're minimized. So it's hard to imagine ransomware being such a huge global problem, you know, a daily, like every day there's ransomware attacks. Like we can't even keep up, you know, we can't write, write stories fast enough to keep with all the, you know, now nowadays, like we, we hear about like a medium sized company getting ransomware and we're like, not even newsworthy anymore. No, it's like, you know, car gets robbed, you know, it happens. Um, and it would just not like, the problem would not be at this scale without something like Bitcoin. Same question you just. Yeah, absolutely. It is in the same way that the dark web markets relies on the two technologies of Tor and Bitcoin, ransomware at the scale that operates at today inherently relies uh, on cryptocurrency because yes, there is a bottleneck and there can be difficulties, but it does allow for the relatively easy um, extraction of funds and extortion. You know, it is key to ransomware and maybe you would go and, you know, it would be cash in a bag or something like that, but that's just not how it works. This is streamlined now with cryptocurrency. Same question to you, Rina. Yeah, I, I think it just comes down to how easy is it to uh, execute this type of crime? Like, I recently read a, a book called uh, The Skies Belong to Us about how airplane hijackings used to be very, very common mm -hmm. because it was super easy to just like board a plane, no ID, cash in hand, sit down, plane gets up in the air and you're like, hey, I want to take over the cockpit and we're going to go to Cuba. And uh, hijackings today, much, much harder because we put in place a bunch of different safety measures along the way and we've learned from the past. And mm -hmm. I think that that's where we are with cryptocurrency now. We're sort of seeing how easy it is to use for this type of crime. We're seeing this being leveraged in that way. Then the question just becomes, how can we, can we regulate it in some way? Can we shut it down entirely? Do we want to do that? Um, I think we're definitely seeing it at the scale it is today because it is easy. And so the question is, how can we make it harder?